There is a disease that affects rose bushes called rose mosaic. It's caused by a virus and um, it's mainly in the United States. You don't often see it outside the US or if you do, you tend to see it on plants that were taken to wherever they are from the US. And the reason it's, it's almost uniquely a problem here is the way we have traditionally propagated our roses in nurseries as opposed to the way the rest of the world has done it. It was estimated back in the 1970s that probably more than 90% of all the rose bushes in the US had this disease. Um, there have been nurseries over the last 50 years that have really worked at getting rid of it, as well as several university research programs. And I'm happy to say we've been a part of that. It's still a very common problem, even with new varieties, but my estimate, and this, I don't have a good, good, uh, any good real proof of this number, but if I had to guess just from what I see out in retail nurseries, maybe 20% of the roses for sale right now have this disease. That's still a, a big rate of infection. We'd like to get it a lot lower than that, but it's a great improvement over 90%. It is a virus disease, but just like the common cold or flu, it's not caused by just one virus. It's a series or a collection of symptoms that several different variety, several different viruses can cause. So the first one of these is Prunistochronic ring spot virus. That's way too much to say or spell. And so we always just abbreviate that PNRSV. Um, it is by far the most common one. When we test roses for what virus is in them, I would say we come up with this one more than 90% of the time. There's another one. Oh, and I should say prunus is the Latin name, the genus of fruit trees that have a pit for their seeds. So peaches, plums, cherries, apricots, those are all in the plant genus prunus. And then necrotic is an old fashioned word that means dead or dying. Back in the day in the newspaper, instead of having the obituary section, they had the necrology session, section. And then a ring spot uh, is, is on a leaf, on a peach tree, if it has this disease, it develops ring shaped spots on the leaves and then that ring dies. So on a peach, you get necrotic ring spots on the leaf. It doesn't do that on a rose, but that's how the virus got named. And then there's apple mosaic, which as its name implies is a natural disease of apple trees. It's much more rare in roses. It, you do see it on, on occasion, but it causes much more severe symptoms. And I think that's probably why it's rare on roses. It is so ugly and it's so difficult to grow a plant with it that the nurseries never get it up to a size and of a quality that they would actually want to sell to you at a Lowe's or a Home Depot. And so it's kind of rare. And then the third one is Arabus mosaic. This is a virus that is native on a little weed in the genus Arabus in Northern Europe. Uh, we don't have that weed as far as I know in the US. We also don't believe we have the virus uh, in it in the US. So in European rose gardens and in rose gardens in other parts of the world, you might see mosaic symptoms on a rose bush. And there's one of two problems there, one of two possibilities. Either it has Arabus mosaic or much more likely, they may have imported uh, the variety from the US. In which case it's one of those other, those first two viruses. Well, the symptoms, um, the, the main symptom is known as a mosaic. It's a yellow or white patchy area on the leaf. I'm gonna show you pictures of these in just a couple of minutes. Um, it, it, kind of reminds me of a stained glass window. Um, and there's a line pattern where you have yellow or, or sometimes white zigzaggy lines on a leaf and the zigs and zags change direction uh, when it crosses a vein. There's the watermark symptom, which is just like the line pattern, but it's very faint. It's, it's one shade of green on a background of a different shade of green, but it's still little swirly lines. You can get vein banding, which is yellow or orange veins on an otherwise green leaf. So this is typical mosaic. In some cases, it's just kind of patchy all over the leaf. In some cases, it may very closely follow a vein as a border. Um, I can't tell you why it will choose to do one or the other. Obviously, it can do both on the same leaf. This is also typical mosaic. 
This is the zigzag line pattern, and you can see how the points of the zigzags are on veins. And then this is a ring spot. So if this was on a peach tree, that area would die. On a rose, it won't. It'll just stay as a yellow ring. This is an unusually brilliant line pattern. Back ancient years ago, when I was an undergraduate college student, they, Disney had just opened Epcot. And so spring break, my family went to see this new park called Epcot. And I remember in front of the USA Pavilion, they had planted a gigantic bed of Mr. Lincoln roses, which is a dark red rose we grow it. It's in the center of the Jenkins Rose Garden over here on campus. And the leaves looked like this. They had these yellow stripes all over them. And as an undergraduate college student, I had no real horticultural training. I had no interest and no interest in or background in plant pathology at all. And so I didn't realize this was a disease. I just remember um, they had really pretty leaves and I wondered how they ever got a rose to do that. How would you make it, make a pattern like that on the leaves? And um, just kind of kept that in the back of my mind then for years. And when I finally started working with rose mosaic, it hit me, those plants were all diseased. Nobody did that on purpose. And sure enough, that's what was going on. Those roses are no longer there. They removed them soon after that, probably because they ended up dying with the disease. This is vein banding, where you have the lighter colored vein on an otherwise darker green leaf. Much less common, but you do see it now and then. And then just some various patterns that we've seen on roses. Nice ring spots. This is on a rose at the Royal Botanic Garden at Kew, which is just outside London, England. And as I was just saying, it's kind of unusual to see mosaic outside the US. So I got down under the plant, looked for the tag, and sure enough, it was an American variety that had been imported from an American nursery. So we sent them the disease, sorry to say. This is the um, watermark symptom. It's like the vein banding, but it's much fainter and harder to see. There's a really faint watermark, but that's definitely viral. So visual symptoms normally show up on the spring growth flush here in Lakeland. As you know, if you're on campus, we prune the roses severely in late February or early March, and then they sprout out. So right now they're in full bloom. So this is the time of year we would be likely to see the, the symptoms. If you were up north where the plants went through a winter, again, on that first growth flush in the spring is where you're gonna see this. Even then it often occurs on just a few leaves on the whole bush. The rest of the bush looks normal. And some plants may have no symptomatic leaves at all for, for years at a time. I have one plant over in Ruth Rose Garden that has been there now. The garden is seven years old. That plant has been there almost that whole time. It has never shown symptoms, but I know it's infected. So um, for most of the year, there's not gonna be any visible symptoms at all. And on some plants, there may be no symptoms at all, even in the right season. And so if you're trying to figure out if a rose is infected or not, the fact that you don't see any symptoms is not a good way to determine that. If you see symptoms, then yes, you can say it's, it's infected. But the fact that it doesn't look infected doesn't mean that it's not. It can be asymptomatic for a long time. Well, if that's the case, if it just affects a few leaves, making them pretty color patterns for part of the year, why would we care? Unfortunately, that's not all it does to the bush. It also reduces the bush vigor. It doesn't grow as fast as it would have otherwise. It produces fewer flowers on shorter stems. I don't have it as a bullet point here, but the flowers will also on average be smaller. Well, the reason you grow a rose bush is you want big, nice flowers on long stems on a healthy bush. It's working against you on all of those counts. If you're up north, the plant will be less cold hardy. It's much more likely to be injured or even killed by, by uh, cold in the winter. We don't worry about that here, but that's very important in places with a real winter. Uh, in the nursery, they're much more difficult to graft successfully. Your graftage 
success rate will be substantially lower with infected plants. And even the ones, the grafts that take, it's much more difficult to produce a quality plant and get it ready for sale at retail. So you'll end up not making as many plants per year that your nursery can sell, that raises your production costs. And then in the garden, the plants don't live as long as a healthy plant would. We figure four or five years in most cases uh, here, uh, as I say, I've got one up in Roos Rose Garden that's going on seven years, but it's also not very healthy at this point. It's not showing virus symptoms, it's just not very healthy. I try in this class to base what we say on good scientific evidence or data and to tell you if I'm not doing that. And so this, what, this slide is about an area that is really not supported by hard data-based evidence. Nevertheless, it's something that I do believe based on anecdotal evidence. There is an idea that roses over time, well, I should start out by saying, obviously you and I and our dogs and cats and other mammals go through a life cycle where we eventually get old and eventually we die. A plant doesn't normally have to do that. Most perennial plants, at least in theory, could live forever unless something kills them. And so, and in, and in rose bushes, we grow a rose up in Roos Rose Garden called Autumn Damask that we know that Virgil the poet wrote about in the year 14 BC. So that rose that's now well over 2000 years old, it still grows in our garden. It's perfectly healthy and happy. So aging to the point of death is not a normal thing for a perennial plant to do. But there is some thought that some rose varieties decline over the years. And I've put that in quotes because that's what they call it. And what they're saying is it's just not as good a rose as it used to be. And so my example here is peace. Peace was uh, um, introduced in 1945 after World War II uh, and they invented the United Nations. And before the United, States, United Nations moved to New York City, it first met in San Francisco in 1945. And on the day all those delegates came for their first meeting, uh, they put a bud of this rose on every delegate's desk and they named it peace. Well, because of the symbolism of that post-war, um, it became the world's most popular rose. And, and to this point in history, um, there have been well over 200 million of them grafted and marketed around the world. Well, it was said that when it, was, when it first came out, it was a deep yellow with a bright orange or red edge to the petals. And yet most of the ones you see in the US now look like this, very, very pale yellow, almost white with the tiniest hint of pink. Well, when I got a plant like this, it had rose mosaic virus. And so I put it through my heat therapy program to cure it as I do with other roses. I'm gonna to talk to you about that in a few minutes. And look what came out. It's the old fashioned original piece that is not declined anymore. So what does that mean? Does it mean that rose mosaic virus was the cause of decline? I don't know that. Could it be some other virus that my heat therapy program happened to cure? Could it be an epigenetic effect? That's where, where you, you don't have a virus there or anything, but there are certain factors in the cell that turn certain genes on and off at certain times in a life cycle. And maybe we've switched those back to the younger uh, form. We don't know. What we do know is that if I heat treat a so-called declined rose, I can make it better regardless of its disease set, uh, status. So that's kind of cool. <coughs> so that part we've demonstrated. What we don't know is what is this thing we call decline? What causes it? Um, we really don't know that. So that may have nothing to do with rose mosaic, but it's a nice little side effect that we discovered from our, our program. So these viruses have existed for thousands, perhaps millions of years on their wild, their wild host type plants, which are either in the genus Prunus, these cherries, plums, peaches, or in the genus Pyrus, which would be apples and pears. And in those plants where the virus is native, it is spread by the bees in pollen. So if, a, if pollen is taken from an infected tree 
and put on the flower of an uninfected tree, not always, but sometimes the virus will spread into that second tree. So that's a natural means of contagion. If you take seeds from an infected tree and plant them, a very small percentage, less than 1%, but a significant number if you're planting thousands uh, of those seedlings will be infected as soon as they sprout. So it is technically feasible that it could pass from the mother plant into the seedling, however rare that is. So the reason those viruses don't affect every single peach and apple tree on the earth is probably this fact that it's a very small percentage that end up catching it via seeds. And so if you have a clean plant, as long as it's not getting pollinated from an infected plant, um, it's likely to stay clean. And I, I use the word clean here to mean free of the virus disease. Uh, and that's used very commonly among people who talk about plant viruses. And so don't, don't think I'm meaning we wash the plant. I'm, I'm meaning it is free of virus if I say it's a clean plant. In roses, even though they're in the same plant family as those fruit trees, it, it's not a natural thing in roses. And um, there has been a lot of research to see how could it spread in a rose garden or a rose nursery. And that, a lot of that research was done at the University of California at Davis back in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. And to some degree, they're continuing that now. But it's quite old research. Um, and as, as well as just anecdotal, anecdotally people watching it in gardens and nurseries, it doesn't seem to spread through pollen ever. Uh, and at UC Davis, they purposely took known infected pollen and pollinated thousands of plants and never once could they get the virus to be transmitted. It's never spread through seeds. Again, you can grow hundreds of thousands of seedlings from infected rose plants and every single seedling will be clean. It, it never ever spreads through seed. It also doesn't seem to ever be spread by insects or mites. So whereas uh, citrus greening is spread by, uh, by a psyllid insect or humans get malaria or yellow fever from mosquitoes, that sort of thing does not seem to be happening with this disease in roses. It's never spread mechanically. There's been a lot of research again at Davis and we did a little bit of it here back in the day on um, uh, pruning with, with regular pruning clippers and not sterilizing them between plants, just moving from plant to plant. The clipper might actually still have a little bit of the wet sap on it from the previous plant. That does not spread the disease. So the only means we've ever found in, in now oh, uh, approaching 100 years of research that we know we can spread it from one rose to another is by budding or grafting. Um, it, it simply doesn't happen any other time or place. And so the only natural spread we've seen in the field was in a research plot at the University of California, Davis, where they planted their, their plants six inches apart. Whereas in a garden, you put them several feet apart. And in that trial, they did see it moving from plant to plant. Well, when they dug up the plants, what they found was when you plant them that close together, the rootstock they were using makes natural root grafts between plants. So again, it was passing through a graft union. It was not being spread by any other means. And when you plant them as far apart as you do in a garden, we don't have a, we have no recorded cases of roses making root grafts. They have to be really, really close together to do that. So from a practical standpoint, we don't think it ever spreads in a rose garden and it would never spread in a normal commercial type nursery. You have to plant them too close together to make that happen. So if it only spreads by grafting and it's not inherently in roses, the question comes up, how did the first rose get it? It had to get into roses at some point by some means. And the correct scientist answer to that is, we don't know. So again, as I say, I like to warn you if I'm not gonna use good scientific data, the story I'm about to tell you, I am making up. It is not documented as being true. It is a made up story, but it is how we think. Certainly this is the way the virus could have got into roses. It's the way we think it probably did, but we do not have evidence that this is what happened. We don't have a better answer though. So this is what we think probably happened. First off, we know that the first clear record of this disease 
in roses occurred in California in the 1920s on plants that were grafted to the rootstock called Dr. Huey. This is Dr. Huey here. Some of you who are from north of here, uh, uh, if you go home for the summer, notice that in June, lots of people have rose bushes in their yards and the older lawns with the older rose bushes, about half of them are gonna be this rose. Those people didn't plant that rose on purpose. What they did was they planted a virus infected grafted rose on Dr. Huey. It died of winter cold injury and the rootstock sprouted up from underground. So now they've got all these dark red roses all over the place. And when I travel in Pennsylvania or New Jersey or New York or, or Massachusetts, they're everywhere. Uh, it, it, it's funny, you can go through a neighborhood and almost half the houses will have a Dr. Huey plant and they don't know why it was there. But anyway, they, they were using Dr. Huey as a rootstock in California. The thing that makes this different from European nurseries or older nurseries in the Eastern US is the Californians were the first ones to use this particular rootstock and they propagated it by cuttings, not by seed. The traditional way of producing rose rootstocks was always from seed. And as I said on the previous slide, this virus does not spread through seeds. So as long as the nursery starts with new seedlings as their rootstocks in each generation, they never infect their plants. So now we've got a situation, the plants are still not infected, but um, the potential is there that if we get it into the Dr. Huey rootstock, then it could enter the various grafted scion varieties. So here's where we start making up our story. Somebody may have recognized that roses are in the same family as a lot of these fruit crops, peaches, apples, plums, and um, maybe they were taking a plants and society course or an introduction to horticulture, horticulture course somewhere, and they had learned a little bit about plant families, and they'd learned a little, about, a little bit about grafting, and now they want to try their hand at it, and they think, well, isn't this cool? They're closely related. Maybe I could have an apple tree that bears roses on it, or maybe I could have a rose bush that grows peaches. Wouldn't that be cool? Let's try grafting them together. In reality, those grafts always fail. The genus Rosa, to which all of the flowering roses belong, is not graft compatible with any other genus in the family. So the graft will always fail when you try that. But if you put a bud from an apple or a peach onto a rose rootstock, yes, it would die, but it might live long enough to transfer any virus in it. That's what we think probably happened. And so uh, at that point, we have a failed peach tree or apple tree on a rose rootstock. The scion died, but now we have a rose rootstock that's infected. We're assuming then, and again, I'm making this up, that the grower, rather than in disgust throwing that now dead grafted plant out, because the rootstock was still alive, they saved it and budded a rose back onto it. So now we have a rose grafted onto a rose rootstock, which has the virus. And the virus is gonna move up into the top of the plant. And at that point, we have the first grafted rose bush with this disease. The next assumption we have to make is that maybe this person was an amateur rose breeder and developed a new variety and they gave it or sold it to a nursery to propagate because it has to have entered a commercial nursery at that point. We think this part up here was probably not done by a commercial nursery because they would know better than to graft peaches onto roses. They would realize that doesn't work. So it almost has to be a hobbyist grower that, that put it into the rows, but then it has to enter a commercial nursery field. Now in California nursery tradition, unlike European nurseries or Eastern US nurseries, they are using this Dr. Huey and they take hardwood cuttings. Remember those are the leafless stick cuttings that you don't have to put in mist. And they put those out just in an open field in autumn. The big production area for these is in the uh, Wasco and Ontario, California area. That's, that's east of Los Angeles. And they produce millions and millions of roses there. They, they stick these hardwood cuttings in the autumn and they make roots over the winter and then the next spring, they bud those plants in the field. And then that autumn, they cut the rootstock tops off so that only the cyan bud is there. So it'll grow the next spring. And those rootstock tops that they cut off, 
they make cuttings of for the following year's crop. So here's my one infected plant that I have in this field now. We're gonna take cuttings off the top of that for, to make next year's crop. So here's a really old black and white picture of how they stick the cuttings and then here's a more modern picture. So these are rose cuttings in the field rooting to make rootstocks. So the next spring, they cut bud wood off of those, off of last year's crop to bud the current year's rootstock crop. So assuming that we have an industry that's making countlessly many thousands or even millions of plants per year, and assuming that this only entered that, in, that industry via one plant, I was interested in seeing how quickly would it spread. So I went over to Dr. Serrano in the math department, my favorite statistician. Some of you know Dr. Serrano. Um, and, and I said, I have a little math problem for you here. Let's assume that I have a field with 100,000 cuttings and I'm going to bud them and I'm gonna put in just one bud from my original infected plant. And then that fall, I'm gonna cut five rootstock cuttings off of the top of that for next year and randomly mix them into next year's 100,000 total cuttings. And then the following spring, I'm gonna cut five scions from that plant and bud them to five random rootstocks in that new field of 100,000. How long would it be until the, most of the field is infected? And she did a little bit of work on her scratch paper and she said, within five years, you would be above 95% infection rate in that whole field. It, it spreads at an amazing rate, even if you're not making very many plants from those original plants. And, and that's what happened. So um, if the virus is present in a scion, it moves down into the rootstock. Once it's in the rootstock, any cuttings taken there will be infected. And then when you bud them with a new uninfected variety, it moves up into that variety. And they infected the entire California industry. So we know that part happened. Now we're back on historically documented truth. The question is, how did that first infected rose get there? That's the part that is, is uh, an assumption, not, not known history. So what should they do? And what are those nurseries today doing that don't have the problem? They should maintain what are known as mother blocks where they have healthy rootstock plants that they never graft anything onto. They only take cuttings. They should also have healthy grafted plants of their cyan varieties, that is the varieties they wanna grow, that again, they will never graft back onto. And they always collect their grafting wood as well as their rootstock cuttings from that same field over and over. And so here's where we get to Florida Southern. Ruth's Rose Garden, which is one of the most beautiful spots on the campus, is actually a virus-free mother block. That's its purpose for being there. And there, we get to enjoy it as part of the landscape, but that's not why it's there. It is a mother block for our virus management program. So you always take your rootstock cuttings from a known clean rootstock in the mother block. You always take your budwood for making your new cyan varieties from cl known clean plants in that mother block. And if you do that, you never infect your next year's crop. So that's how nurseries today that are very concerned with selling a clean crop are able to do so. And as I said, we're probably still about 20% infected in the US. That mainly comes from nurseries who don't care to maintain that mother block. And, and the big argument they have against it is that that's land that they will never sell a rose off of, that they're, they're, they, they say it's an economic thing. They can't afford to uh, uh, invest that much in a piece of land that's not productive. And yet, if you look at the reduced grafting success rate for infected plants and the reduced percentage of those plants that are sellable, the people who do believe in it, in it and use it and say that was the best investment we ever made. We're making more money by producing more good plants on the smaller amount of land while we maintain a mother block. So in order for these nurseries to grow clean stuff, where are they gonna get known clean plants? In some cases, you can simply test until you find a plant that is not yet infected and use that then as your source of, of science. 
but there are some rose varieties, in fact, there are a lot of rose varieties where we're not aware of a single clean plant anywhere on the earth. They're all infected. And so in that case, how are we gonna cure them? Well, in your garden, there's really nothing practical you can do to cure them. But in a laboratory situation, we can. And that's what I do here at Florida Southern. So I wanna kind of talk us through that process. It's known as heat therapy. It was originally done at the University of California at Davis, which is their big agriculture school, just as UF is here in Florida. And um, of course they work with a lot of those agricultural fruit crops that get this disease. And so they have the oldest, largest program currently operating. Uh, they've worked with all of these different fruits. Uh, they also do sweet potatoes, various other things. But because they were already working with these fruit trees that get the same viruses, uh, there was a guy that worked for them that just happened to be a hobbyist rose grower. And it, it occurred to him, if this heat therapy works on a, on a peach tree, why wouldn't it work in a rose bush? And he tried it and sure enough, it worked. And, and um, he's gone now, but he was an old friend of mine years and years ago, Carl Loon who talked them into starting a little rose pro program on the side. And so uh, they consider it quite tiny. Nevertheless, it is by far the largest rose heat therapy program in the world. Their collection consists of several hundred rose varieties, mostly very recently introduced modern hybrids. They're often patented and uh, they're what the nurseries want because they're popular today, as well as uh, rootstock for varieties. So this is the Foundation Plant Material Service Program at UC Davis. These are the things they work with. This is their rose field. It's about eight acres. It has more than 400 cyan varieties and seven rootstock varieties. And you can order cuttings or grafting wood from them. These are the rootstock varieties they grow. They got their Fortuniana from me actually. And if you order from them, this is what they send you. This is a bu bundle of sticks. If those were rootstock, you could stick those in the ground and root them yourself. If you're buying cyan varieties, they look just like that, but you're gonna cut buds off the sides of those, sides of those and chip bud them then onto your, your virus-free rootstock plants to make clean roses. There was another program at Oregon State University for many years, but as often happens with any university program, uh, if they run out of budget money or if a faculty member that ran the program retires, that's, that's what happened at Oregon State. Uh, uh, at that point, they close down the program rather than replace, replace the person. And so Oregon State no longer has a Rose Mosaic program at all. Then there were, but the important thing about that was it used to be very important as a supplier and it's where I got my first clean rootstocks. You have to start with clean rootstocks. So that's where I got them. Bear Creek then is a private corporation. They used to own Jackson Perkins and Armstrong Roses. Those were the two largest rose nurseries in the world, which together accounted for about 10 million plants per year, almost all produced in California. Um, they no longer own those companies. Bear Creek is still around, but they don't, they don't deal in roses anymore. Jackson and Perkins is still around under different ownership, but um, this was a private program. They cleaned up their own varieties, but nobody else's and they're no longer in the business of heat treating roses. Then there's us. Uh, I started the program in 1983, shortly after I came to Florida Southern. I've always specialized in older varieties, some of which we would consider antique or heirloom or heritage varieties. Uh, they're things that have been around for a very long time and have a lot of important genetics for breeding work, but they're not as popular today. Over those years, we have cured or certified more than 300 varieties cured means they had the disease and we removed it from them certified means we got a plant that we didn't know for sure if it was infected or not so we tested it and it turned out not to be infected so we didn't have to cure it just as if you go for a covid test and it comes back negative you're you're good to go it's kind of that situation so of these 300 i haven't kept track of the exact numbers but i'd say we've probably cured i'm going to guess 50 or 60 and then the rest of them the great majority of them we've just certified we supply more than 20 nurseries throughout the US, as well as Bermuda, the UK, Brazil, Colombia, Canada, and South Africa. Um, I've also had people take budwood to Europe. I don't know where it's being grown or by whom or how. I didn't ship it there, but um, 
we become kind of known throughout the world. If you want some of these clean varieties, you need to buy them from Florida Southern. We're the only known clean source of a lot of those varieties in the world. So just a picture to rest your eyes from all the research. This is the Jenkins Garden back in the day when we had pink roses there in addition to red and white. It's all red and white now. So if we have to cure a rose, what are we gonna to do to it? We do this thing we call heat therapy. We start out by getting a fairly large plant, the size you might buy at a Lowe's or a Home Depot uh, in a two or three gallon pot. That's a nice big rose bush. I'm gonna stress this plant to the potential of almost killing it. And so I wanna toughen it up ahead of time. And as I think we may have talked about on tissue culture day or some other day when we talked about plant hormones. I'm not sure if we did that in this class or not. There is a hormone called abscisic acid, which is considered the stress hormone. And a plant produces it if it's under severe stress and it helps it survive. And so I want the plant to make lots of abscisic acid. So I'm gonna purposely let it get too dry. I'm gonna let it wilt between waterings. That's a really bad thing to do to a rose bush, but I'm gonna do that on purpose. I'm going to not fertilize it for months. I want it to become really nutrient deficient. If the leaves are bright yellow, I like that. I want it hungry. And I'm gonna grow it in the hottest greenhouse we've got. I wanna almost, but not quite kill it. Because if, if it's, and what that's doing, it's toughening it, toughening it up because it doesn't know what it's about to be hit with. I'm gonna give it a, a torture that would normally kill a regular rose bush. And so by doing this, at least some of them may survive because they were toughened up. Now I'm gonna put the plant in a growth chamber and hold it there at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 38 Celsius, continuously day and night, 24 seven for 28 days. Now, if you're from a hot part of the world like Phoenix, Arizona or, or Las Vegas, you may think to yourself, well, 100 isn't all that hot. It gets hotter than that every afternoon in the summer back home. And yes, that's true. But think about this, even the hottest climate on the earth, even in the middle of the Sahara Desert, there is no natural climate that would fail to drop below this temperature even once day or night for 28 days. That just doesn't happen. Even in Phoenix, if you have a 115 degree day, it's gonna drop to 97 at night. And granted, that's still pretty hot, that's under 100. And so this is a really artificial situation. And in many cases, the rose bush just dies. You've, you've stressed it to the point that it can't handle it. But if it does survive, there's also the potential that the rose bush survived, but the virus in it didn't because the virus is not adapted to multiplying at that high a temperature and it loses its ability to reproduce. And so that's my goal. This is the heat chamber at uh, one of them. They've got a bank of like 13 of these at the University of California at Davis. And inside these are rose bushes being heat treated. They've got automatic water lines here that water them several times a day. Even with the abscisic acid, they're using a lot of water. And you can see those are not happy plants. The leaves are turning yellow and brown and falling off. But hopefully uh, after four weeks up here somewhere, they'll be able to cut a few living buds and uh, propagate their new plants from those. This, these are our chambers. Um, uh, I'm talking to you right now from the basement of the Jack Berry Citrus Building and two doors down from where I am is the room where this growth chamber is. Uh, next fall. I'm on slide. Sorry? What? Somebody's not muted. Please talk to us if you want to. Otherwise, please mute yourself. Um, next fall, if we're not under any COVID restrictions and you'd like a tour, I'd be happy to give you one. Just remind me. So this is inside my heat chamber. It's very similar to Davis's. It's just not as big. I can do about 12 plants at a time. And so, and I also don't have automatic water. So we actually water them every morning and every afternoon. It has lights in there so they can do some photosynthesis. And again, we're holding them at 100 Fahrenheit or 38 C. So you have to water them several times a day. After 28 or more days, you cut your bud wood and you immediately bud those plants onto certified virus-free rootstock. And then we grow them like any nursery plant back in the greenhouse. The original plant, when we take it out of the heat chamber, is not cured. Uh, and so we throw it away. And the reason it's not cured is, as I just said, we water it several times a day. Well, every time you water that pot, it cools down a little. And so the roots 
have not been maintained at a continuous 100 degrees. They've cooled down multiple times a day. And so there's always going to be a little bit of virus hanging out down in those roots. And if you take that plant out of the heat chamber and move it back over to the greenhouse, within a couple of weeks, the virus will migrate back up to the top and the whole plant will be infected again. So if you left it in the heat chamber long enough to actually cure that individual plant, that's long enough that you would always kill the plant. I've never heard of anybody successfully curing a plant in a heat chamber. It's always buds that you cut from it from up on top. And they've been continuously at 100 degrees, even though the roots have not. So we grow that in the greenhouse as a nursery plant, grow a nice big plant out of it, hopefully several of them. We, don't, we try to uh, hedge our bets by making as many of those as we can. Once you have those new plants then, we still are not certain we've killed all the virus out of them. What if, what if a little bit survived and is now multiplying up in them again? And so we have to indexing them, index them. Indexing means to test them to see do they or don't they have that virus in them. So yeah, indexing is any method that tests for the presence of a virus. We use any of several methods. The first one, one of the oldest ones is Shirafujin cherry. If any of you speaks Japanese, I will apologize. I'm sure I'm butchering the word Shirafujin, sounding like an ignorant American, but I don't know how you say it correctly. But it is a flowering cherry tree. I, I put pictures of cherries here, but it doesn't bear any fruit. It's sterile. It's one of those varieties that you might see on the mall in Washington, D.C. at cherry blossom time. It's grown specifically for its big showy flowers in the spring. And that cherry variety, as I think we've talked about on, on cold hardiness and chill units day, we can't grow cherries in Lakeland from year to year. And so I send budwood that I've cut from my test plant. I overnight it to Davis and they bud my rose axillary buds onto Shirafugin cherry trees. The, just as I was saying early on about grafting a peach onto your rose bush, grafting a rose bud onto a cherry tree, the graft always fails. The bud will die before it starts growing. But if it stays alive for a few days and if there's any virus there, it may transfer that virus into the cherry tissue. And at that point, Shirafugin happens to be, we call it hypersensitive. It, it will develop this necrotic area, remember that means dead, and it will bleed this, oh, this nasty brown sticky sap somewhere between molasses and snot. It's disgusting and it comes oozing out of the wound. If there's no virus there, it'll just heal over under that dying rosebud and make normal cherry bark. So they bud them in June and then they go back and they inspect them. That's called reading the test in August or September, and then they send me my results. It doesn't tell you which virus you have. It just says, yes, there's a virus here or no, there's no virus here. Well, of course, my, what I want to hear is there's no virus here, so that's fine. So this is uh, Shirafugin after it's been budded, and, and the reaction is so violent that they can put a different bud there from there from there, and the virus won't even move up and down the stem of the plant. The whole plant never becomes infected because it kills whatever tissue it touches. Next, next year, they'll cut this branch off and they can use this branch on the same tree and it starts out totally clean because the virus simply doesn't move around. So this is a, they, they've cut back this stem to show a nice healthy uh, cambium area. There's the bark, there's the wood. The wood is nice light yellow as cherry wood should be. And then um, a nice clean cambium. Whereas this one was infected, you can see it's giving off the molasses -y, disgusting glop and turning color and turning brown. And uh, so that one's infected, that one's not. The second method that we can use, we do here on campus, and we use an old cut flower florist rose variety called Madame Butterfly. And we bud, we take buds from the plant we want to test and we bud graft them onto a plant that of known hybrid tea, Madame Butterfly, that is certified virus-free to start with. And we do that in the fall. 
And then in the spring, we look on the modern butterfly leaves to see what happens. Modern butterfly is also very susceptible, but it shows bright symptoms in the spring on pretty much all of its leaves. Uh, well, or at least a lot of its leaves, if it's infected. It again, doesn't tell us which virus we have, but it says, yes, there's a virus or no, there's not. So this is Madame Butterfly. And those are the symptoms that I'm looking for. The third method we use is known as ELISA. And we, we contract with Washington State University to do this one. They have a very big ELISA lab and they can do it cheaper than I could ever set up a lab. And I don't wanna do that anyway. ELISA stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. Um, and so they just use the letters to make the acronym ELISA. Uh, this one uses uh, animals, usually a rabbit. And so somebody somewhere had to start out making Anacera. That's not me. It's not the people at Washington State. It's somebody else. The big company that does that in the US is uh, Agdia Inc., which is in Elkhart, Indiana and they make ELISA tests for a lot of things. ELISA is used in human medicine all also. If you ever take a home pre pregnancy test or if you get an HIV test that they can tell you your results in less than half an hour or uh, oh, a bunch of other medical tests are done by ELISA. I, I've wondered if, if it may be being used in, in um, COVID testing and I'm not sure of that, I need to look into that. But in any case, it's a very commonly used method. So that company that's making the Anacera has to start out with a sample of the virus that they're going to want to test. And so they may have a peach tree or an apple tree that they know is infected. They're going to collect tissue off of that plant and they're going to grind it up and go through a big extraction and purification process until they have virtually pure virus particles. And then they're going to inject that virus into an animal. As I say, it's most often a rabbit. Um, uh, there are reasons you would use rabbits as opposed to something else. Um, rabbits are much less likely to bite you than a rat or a mice, a mouse would. Uh, they're much larger, so they have a much higher blood volume and they tend to be friendly. They also live longer than a rat or a mouse would. So one, one rabbit can continue to produce antibodies for years and years. And so almost like the two dose uh, COVID vaccines or a lot, of, a lot of other vaccines we take, you, you inject virus into this rabbit and he makes antibodies to it. And you give him several booster doses at multiple week intervals. Now, at this point, usually there's somebody who's thinking to themselves, what a horrible thing to do to a rabbit that's animal cruelty, they should make them stop. Actually, when I was in graduate school, I worked in, a, in an ELISA lab and we had the happiest bunnies. We loved our bunnies. They loved us. They, they, they would to be delighted to sit in our lap and eat a carrot as you talk to them. And so this process does not hurt the rabbit. Uh, one of the nice things about a rabbit, besides the fact that they're big and, and calm and like to sit in your lap, is that on the backside of a rabbit's ears, very much like a human bodybuilder, they develop these really prominent veins. And if you're a good phlebotomist, that's the person who takes blood samples, you can put a blood sampling needle into one of those veins and the rabbit doesn't even feel it. He has no idea that you're doing that. You're not gonna take enough blood to hurt the rabbit. You're just taking a little sample. And so that's what they do while your bunny is happily sitting in your lap eating his carrot. And so you collect a little bit of rabbit blood and then you purify antibodies out of that. And, and they, they package up those antibodies, they, they uh, ship them frozen. And so the ELISA lab at Washington State or any other ELISA lab anywhere is receiving the, these antibodies in the form of antisera. They're in a, they're in a frozen, um, it was you know, water-based liquid, but they freeze it. And so now that's ready for the ELISA test. So I don't deal with any of this and the ELISA lab in Washington State doesn't deal with any of this. They buy vials of antisera. And you can store those for long periods of time and one rabbit will make enough anisera to test hundreds of thousands of roses. It's, it's uh, amazing how little it takes to run a test. Once you have that, now we're ready to test our heat treated roses. So the people at, at Prosser Washington have bought anisera and I send them leaves from my plant I wanna have tested. And they go through the same process of purifying the virus. They grind up the leaves and extract it and purify the virus. Now, I'm hoping there's no virus there. Nobody knows that at this point. But this extraction and purification process, if there is virus there, 
they'll end up with pure virus. If there's not, they'll end up with nothing. But because viruses are too small to see, even with a microscope, they won't know that until they've done this test. So it's a lab procedure. I, I'm not going to get into the details of how it's done, but they end up, you have this solution, then you put a couple solutions onto a plate, and then you watch it and see if it changes color. And uh, if it changes, it'll turn yellow. If the virus is present, it'll stay clear if the virus is not present. So um, the lab test is specific to a virus species. So you can test for PNRSV versus apple mosaic differently. I, I've got this labeled this way, but now that I look at it, both of these pictures are identical. So I'm not sure which one this actually is, but this is a sample plate. They've got uh, going down this column and along this row, these are known positives where they, they wanted to be sure that their process was working. Those, those needed to turn yellow. And then these are the samples in here in the middle. So this one is heavily infected. It had a very high concentration of virus in it. This one had a lot less, but it's also infected, whereas this one is not infected. And so uh, they run that test and then they send me their results. The advantages is it's quick. Once you have that antiserum, one worker can test at least 200 samples in an eight hour day and they get their results immediately. Relatively cheap, as I, as I say, I hire them to do it because that's cheaper than building a lab. We, we send them, it's less than $20 a sample. It's highly accurate, hardly ever misdiagnosis. There are lots of ELISA labs around. But the reason I use the one at Washington State is their reputation is so good. And, and in years and years of them running it, I've never had to make a mistake. It differentiates which, which virus you've got, not only whether you have a virus. But the downside is it only works if the concentration of the virus is fairly high. That's known as the virus titer. And so in the case of rose mosaic, that means it has to have been produced in cool weather. So from about now on, now that we're starting to get hot weather in Lakeland, I won't send them any tests until next winter. Winter and early spring are the good times to send them samples for testing. The last method that we've been using for the last two years is PCR, which stands for polymerase chain reaction. That is one of the methods that's being used for uh, COVID tests. It's also used in almost anything that we would call DNA testing, whether that's for medicine, for criminology, whatever. It's, it's a lot, got a lot of wide, wide uses and it can identify specific regions of DNA and virus DNA has unique regions on it that you can find that are different from what the plant would have very accurate. It's at least as accurate as ELISA. And in hot weather, it's more accurate because it will measure much lower titers, that is lower virus concentration. And that's being done for us by Texas A&M University. And they have tested our entire collection by that method. So how do we know we can believe the results? First off, I always send my tests to them blind. I send a whole box full of little baggies uh, with leaves in them and all they have on the surface of the baggie is a code number. So they don't know which plants are in which bag. They don't know whether I think they're infected or not. And in among those, I purposely secretly include a few that I know are certified clean, as well as a few that I know are infected. And when they send me their results back, they have to get all of those known con those controls, known to me, but blind to them. They have to get those all right before I'll believe they're results on my unknown samples. And um, they're very good at doing that. In more than 30 years, I've never had a rose that once certified clean has ever gone back to being positive. Uh, the last time we sent things to Texas A&M for PCR, I had some things that last year tested positive that this year test negative. So they're working on their protocols. They think there's something wrong with the way they're doing their test. That doesn't say that my roses do or don't have the virus though. So, and the methods always agree, other than that one glitch in this last test with, with Texas A&M. If one method says a plant's infected, they all do. If one method says it's clean, they all do. So that's, that's nice. Once I have a plant certified clean, I propagate disease-free plants. I put at least one out in the garden to serve as a stock plant. And then we provide certified budwood or cuttings or plants to the nursery industry as they order them. They pay for them. And so we're not using any Florida Southern tuition funds for this program. I donate my own time, but otherwise they pay the expenses. Plus a little more, we end up with more money coming in than we're putting out for the uh, program. So it's a nice program. 
There's one last little thing I'd like to talk about before we quit, and that's rose rosette virus. This is a totally different disease, totally unrelated to rose mosaic, but because among rose growers, they'll say a plant has virus, that's unfortunate because there's more than one virus. This disease is relatively new just in the last 20 years in the US, and it's always fatal without exception. It's spread by mites, so it is contagious in your garden. So those two things together make it really scary. We don't believe we have it in Florida at the moment. It has been found in a couple of nursery shipments that came into the state. They burned those shipments. So again, and still, we believe we are without the disease. We're also without the mite, and we hope not to ever get that mite established in the state. But it's, a, it's one of those very iffy things. You just hope it won't come here. And so we need to be super careful about bringing in contaminated roses. I have a friend here in town who called me up a, a year or so ago and was talking about this wonderful rose that she took a cutting up from her aunt. And could I tell her how to root it and grow it in her garden? And I said, oh yeah, where does your aunt live? And she said, Eastern Tennessee. Well, I knew that's the hot spot for this disease. And I said, I hate to tell you this, but you need to burn those cuttings right now or seal them up in a black plastic trash bag and send them off to the landfill. We do not want that disease or those mites in Lakeland. And she did so, she was unhappy about it, but she understood that it could ruin all the roses in town, including her own. The other scary thing is we don't know of any way to cure it. So this is the disease, it's pretty obvious. If you ever see a rose bush doing this, uh, if it's yours, burn it or bury it or set it off to the landfill. If you see it on somebody else's property, try to tell them about it because uh, it is highly contagious. But you get these unusually red growths. Those are leaves. They're, they're thin like ribbons, so they're really weird looking. Uh, it may also make way, way, way too many thorns. They're, they're so packed in so tightly that you can hardly fit them all. Now, a lot of roses make kind of a coppery purple new leaf, but they wouldn't be showing the, the, uh, the, the thorniness. They also tend to branch too often, and that's known as a witch's broom. So this is typical witch's broom symptom. Here's a diagram. This is an infected plant. This is a healthy plant. And then this is Roundup growing out, uh, not, not Roundup, uh, Knockout. Grow, <laughs> uh, knockout, a very popular rose today. Uh, disease resistant to a lot of things, but not, not to rose rosette. And so this has rose rosette. That plant really needs to be destroyed quickly. Okay, I'm going to stop.